Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interviewer. My guest today is Lisa Wingate, where we're going to be talking about her new book, The Book of Lost Friends. And I know that many of you were huge fans of Lisa's last book, Before We Were Yours. Many of you were in book groups that spoke about it, and it was just one of those books that resonated with so many people. So I am so excited to be sharing this book with you today and then be able to talk to you about that going forward. I had the pleasure of hearing Lisa speak in Philadelphia back in January, and I was so excited about being able to interview her. So welcome, Lisa. So great to have you here. It is so good to be here. Hello from Texas. <laughs> and you know, till yesterday, I didn't know that you were from Texas. I knew you were from someplace in the South, but I didn't know it was Texas. Oh, yeah. No, I am. Um, well, I actually grew up in Oklahoma, but I married into a big uh, clan of Texans, and so... I raised little Texans and, and we're in Texas. So you're in Texas, you're in yes. Texas. So I would like you to share with everybody how you came to the idea because it's just this really interesting story. So let's start with that. Okay, so I, I never know, I always tell people, I never know where an idea is gonna come from. Um, and a lot of people tell me stories when I travel or email me stories or you know go to somebody's town and they'll say, hey, you know, there's a Civil War battleship sunken in our river, or so, you know something interesting I should know. And I never know which ones are going to, I mean, they all fascinate me. I never know which ones are gonna just spark my mind, just kind of set my mind on fire. So I was working on a different book that was to be my next book after Before We Were Yours. In fact, I had, when I was out speaking about Before We Were Yours, I had been telling people about it. It was a piece of history I loved, um, but I was, literally sitting on the back porch working on it one day. I was procrastinating, which I'm known to do. Um, and so I was looking at the email and I had an email from a reader who had just read before we were yours. And she said in the email, um, there's another piece of history I think you should know about. And what she had been doing, this woman, Diane Floche, had been entering um, old newspaper advertisements in a database for the historic New Orleans collection. She'd been working as a volunteer to enter these uh, decades, over a century old newspaper advertisements in this database. And these are called the Lost Friends advertisements. They ran in a column called the Lost Friends. And what they were, were um, newspaper or letters written to the editor after the Civil War by newly freed people so people who had been formerly enslaved all through the South. Um, and during slavery, families were very often very commonly separated. And so um, when these people are finally free, they want to find their families. And they come up with this ingenious way of doing it. They write to this newspaper in New Orleans. These are published in the Lost Friends column. The Lost Friends column goes out to hundreds of post offices, hundreds of churches, um, thousands of subscribers all through the South and Southwest, and it requests that pastors will read um, the ads from their pulpits every Sunday, and so that if anyone out there has information, they can send it back to the person who is looking for their family. And so it was a means of these families trying against all odds, against um, completely lost hope to find each other in this vast country um, after they're finally free to do so. Well, you know, I can imagine there's a real treasure trove sitting and reading these because you're reading people's stories, people's family histories. What was that like to just be reading like one story after the next? It was amazing. Um, Diane had attached a few of them to the email a few of the the ones she was digitizing that day or whatever and so i read those and then she had given me the link to the database which is online it's you, anyone can look at it it's the historic new orleans collections lost friends database there are over 2500 of these ads in there at this point so 2500 families tens of thousands of names because a lot of these were big families some of these you know there were 10 12 15 children involved and sometimes um aunts, uncles, grand, you know, grandparents, things like that. So um, tens of thousands of people and everyone is a story. That's what Diane had said in her email to me. Every one of these is a story. 
And she was so right. Everyone is the story of a family um, torn apart, mothers having sometimes child after child after child torn from them, or sometimes um, someone would die and all the estate property, including the people owned by the estate, mm -hmm. would go into um, division from the will um, and the, the families would just be torn apart and part, you know, some, some would get taken somewhere else. And, um, sometimes people were just sold to traveling traders who were going by. Uh, there were all different ways that these people ended up separated, but there in these ads, the stories of these people who have been gone from the earth for, you know, a hundred and 150 years. Um, and, and many are probably at this point, you know, their names are forgotten. They were probably buried in, in graves without, um, without marked stones that still bear their names. So these people are gone from the earth, most of them, forgotten from the earth, um, except maybe in some family lore of some families. And all of a sudden, out of dusty file cabinets and university archives come these smudged ads in old newsprint that are the stories, these little encapsulated stories of their lives. And I was just, I tumbled down the well of these and I was just fascinated. I thought Diane is so right. Every one of these is a story of um, perseverance, you know, a story of sadness first and then perseverance and hope and determination and how much family means and I think now that we're all separated in social distancing we're more acute mm -hmm. to that you know what do you want most when you can't have it that you sometimes maybe you know we take for granted in everyday life you want your family right. and so that's the first thing you know the first thing these people do and this is how they do it and by pure accident of history or whatever it's in print so it survives to today are the actual ads that are in the book are those actual ads that ran or did you create them for this book because i know that so there we i wanted to put yeah yeah um i wanted to put actual ads in the book because i when i was reading the collection i thought it i mean hopefully a lot of people go to the database and look at the ads for themselves because it is, it is such a clear picture of what in their own voices in the voices of lived experience what these people experienced what you know where they were what had happened to them but also um it i wanted to put some in the book mm -hmm. so that people would would see the stories of these people and all and, and if you're really following in the book in the modern parts you will see the names repeated mm -hmm. um because that was the other thing i thought there there are there are descendants of these people walking around everywhere undoubtedly and they maybe don't even know mm -hmm. you know unless they're really into genealogy uh, which some people use the database for genealogy but you know a lot of people probably don't even know that this is part of their history that there's this little square of their history out there on this database waiting to be found I, you know so um the ads in the book are real except for hanny's the one uh, that that in, that hanny characters ad is based on a real ad but it's fictionalized well, you know, I loved reading them because it does give you such a flavor of the desperation from the people and the hopefulness. There were both of those emotions were coming through. I know you like telling stories that have dual narrative timelines in fiction. You really enjoy doing that. And this book is set in both 1865 and 1987. So let's start out with 1865. This was a time when the effects of the war hadn't worn off yet. America was still somewhat broken. So tell us about Hanny and the, your main character in that timeline. How was, did she come to you? So Hanny, I read an ad. Um, I thought that this would be, the, I knew I wanted to write about the lost friends. Um, I, you know, it sort of haunted me and I felt really compelled by it, but I thought it would be my next, next book. You know, I would take some time to research it over time, et cetera. And uh, then Diane, every so often she would send me an ad or two. She, she said somewhere in our communication, I can only do so many 
in a day because it just gets really emotional. And so I have to step away from it. And so she sent me an ad one day that she had digitized uh, by a woman named Caroline Flowers. And it was a very long detailed one about this family who is stolen by a nephew of the plantation owner. And uh, he flees with this family. Um, and what he's doing as he flees is just selling them off willy nilly along the way. And so um, they end up all over the place. And this ad is her way later in life trying to find the family who was ripped apart and distributed during this wild flight by this criminal. And so um, that's the basis of Hanny's ad, became the basis of her story. And I just, when I read Caroline's ad, I just thought, I need to write about this now. I want to write about this now. I want to tell this story. And so Hanny's story was born out of um, Caroline Flowers' ad. It's a little bit of a reverse trajectory of, of Caroline's ad because Caroline comes from Texas, but Hanny comes from New Orleans area down along the river road between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And it's a, it's a flight to Texas, um, which goes along with the history of the Louisiana, Louisiana and Texas and the Civil War has an interesting history because in, or not, yeah, the state of Louisiana on the whole, but especially the Southern part, the federal forces come up the river very early on. And so the area along the river is the federal forces take it over by, by water. And um, what happens in a lot of those plantations there, in a, when they can, um, people pack up their belongings there um, in whatever way they can, on a riverboat, on a wagon, they pack up everything and flee. And of course they drag their, their enslaved people with them. And so then they went to Texas most often to do what they called going refugee um, because they thought they could wait out the war in Texas till it was over and then they'd come back. So um, Hanny has, has ended up experiencing that in her younger life. They've made it back to the, come back to the plantation, but we're 10 years after the Civil War, so 1875 into Reconstruction. Uh, which is a very, still a very difficult, fractious period. And Hanny is just coming of age in this period at 18. She has watched the road all her life, waiting for her mama to come back and get her, because that was another thing that happened after the Civil War. You have all these uh, orphans, uh, children separated, children with no parents around who've been separated from their parents, yet they're still underage. And they are at the mercy of whatever adults are around them because they're just children. But a lot of parents went and walked, some walked all over the country to find their kids because for the first time in their lives, they have a right to their children. Right and to so, yeah. And so Hanny has watched for her mom, but her mom has never come. And that's kind of where the story starts. Yeah. You know, I, I was surprised because when, in doing my research, I learned that the Civil War was the war with the most American casualties. And that's something that I didn't realize till then. And families across the country after the war are coming to terms with what happened. And really what this searching, is this a way that people learn to cope? Because they were going to look for their lost one, you know, their lost loved ones. Is it a way that they like were trying to build their lives back? I think in, in some, I think yes, in some ways. And I think it was something they had kept the hope of all through their lives. Because when you look at these ads, what you see is that by oral tradition, these people had preserved everything they knew about where they had last seen their relatives. If they could find out, if they had been um, at a, a slave sale, for instance, um, if they could find out in any way where, who took the person off or where the person was being taken to, they kept that in oral tradition. So many of these families had preserved these details on the hope that they would one day be able to go and search for their people, to go and find their family members. And so I think it was a hope that many of them carried that if they got free in one way or another, um, either, you know, emancipation happened or if they got north and got free, you know, they wanted to find their family and put their families back together. 
Yeah. And as Hanny's traveling, she's traveling with two other young women or with her. What made you decide to have her have traveling companions? Is it because the world was so unsafe for them at that time? I sort of wanted to look at the story through, um, through a few different perspectives. And I knew this would be the story of three girls kind of all in their late teenage years coming of age, basically. And that this journey would be this journey, this um, odyssey into Texas for them would be something that would change all of them, that would, that would bring them um, into adulthood. And I began to see the three girls, Hanny, formerly enslaved on Go at Goswood Grove and now sharecropping, which wasn't a lot different in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, Lavinia, the privileged daughter of the house, and uh, Juno Jane, had Lavinia's Creole half-sister, illegitimate Creole half-sister. One of the things people don't know about uh, pre-Civil War history in New Orleans is that there were whole neighborhoods that were kept by what was called placage. And placage was a system where many of the rich planters kept a second wife of color mm -hmm. and families. And there were whole neighborhoods and many of these people um, were you know, lived in big houses and even had uh, slaves to take care of their houses and, and whatnot. And it was a whole, it was kind of goes with the French culture of New Orleans. And some of the men would send these, what they called left-hand family children. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they would send the sons and daughters off to Europe to be educated and, and things that just varied, I'm sure, what those circumstances were like. But so Juno Jane is the daughter by Pocage. And so all three of the, none of the three of these girls like each other at all. Um, <laughs> and they all have their resentments, understandably, against each other. And really what, what kicks the story off, I'll kind of be careful not to give any spoilers, but what kicks the story off is the fact that William Gossett, the owner of the plantation, has disappeared into Texas, um, possibly dead. And if that happens, it puts into question Hanny's sharecropping, uh, the, the sharecropping contract that Hanny is involved in, and the inheritance between Lavinia and Juno Jane. So they, all, they each have an interest mm -hmm. in taking this journey. They would just rather not take it together, but they end up having to. You know, I found the New Orleans relationships, relationships so interesting because I didn't realize it was something that happened that much and how complex those relationships were. And I love the way that you sum it up in one word to describe these relationships, that there was jealousy, resentment, bitterness, and competition. The men had great wives, the women and children, not so much. <laughs> and that's really yeah. what it was. These men had these fabulous, oh, this is what I'm going on you know, with my life. But these divided families, which were all held together by these men, it was, they were having a grand old time and not many other people were. And they disappeared for long periods of time from what you said. They, they did. It, it's this, when you, when you try to kind of internalize it in human terms, it's so hard to imagine. But um, they, you know, yeah, they, they had these whole second families, many of them, often, um, a planter, if he had a young son coming up, sometimes they would, uh, marriage and marriage, it wasn't, I don't know what, because arrangements were, uh, brokered ahead of time before he even, before he married, if they would broker a placage arrangement for him and he would have a left-hand family by placage. And, it was just, it was part of the culture of the area and there are neighbor, neighborhoods that, that were the neighborhoods full of these um, families by Pocage. And it was not something, it was something I had heard of a little bit, but didn't really know that much about it till I started digging into it. And it seemed like quite a likely thing that, that someone in that area down along the river road, which is where a lot of the really stately plantations in Louisiana were. And, uh, it, you know, up and down the river in those days to, to hop a, a riverboat um, and go up or down the river was, people did it all the time. It was very easy. It was very practical. All the farms along the river road um, had river landings of their own. And they would literally just go out there and, and, 
thumb down a riverboat like hailing a cab mm -hmm. and and take the ride back and forth or if they knew when the mail boat was going or whatever um they would go out there and catch a boat and so it was it made it very practical to have this kind of lifestyle in that area this dual lifestyle going back and forth i will confess that um the surprise to me was i never thought about slavery in texas i had never thought that i mean I knew it was in the south but i never thought as far down as texas and if, when I was reading, I was like, wait a second, how did I miss that in history? How did I miss that that was what was going on? Um, the one, the, you are, articulate the, also the differences between being a slave and a slave cropper, a sharecropper, which um, the latter is something that people aspire to. And even though it doesn't seem like it's a great life, she was very proud that that's what her life was and that's what she had. Um, what was what did you learn about the sharecropping? Did you, did you know a lot about it before this or was this something you learned as well? I didn't know a lot about sharecropping. I mean, just um, anecdotally and from novels or things I'd read, but um, sharecropping is, was, but where I'll tell you where I learned a lot about what sharecropping was like in this, because it's a, it's a fairly new system mm -hmm. in the South after the Civil War, because of course, before that, it had been the land had been worked by people who were enslaved and had to do it so when emancipation happens something new has to come along and of course you know you see in, in england and stuff the tenant farming and all that so it's kind of a similar thing to that um but most of the contracts amounted just to economic slavery they traded at the the plantation store um they were always they could never make up the debts you know never catch up with the debts but you do see in the in the slave narratives i read hundreds of the wpa slave narratives that were taken interviews taken down um by by roosevelt's federal writers during the depression with the last survivors of slavery so they traveled all over interviewed people who had who remembered slavery and um got their their voices and their their stories in their own words and a lot of them, of course, remembered when the transition happened from emancipation, um, enslaved workers to share crop. And it varied the terms that people were offered. Some people, um, all they got out of it was pretty much endless work and a, a very subsistence living. Some people, the terms were better and, it, and you know, if they would work the land so many years, they were going to get a piece of land. And so that's what Hanny's aiming toward mm -hmm. is they are on this. If, if the person who owned the land was really low in resources um, at the time the Civil War ends, which many people were, um, a lot of times they didn't have much choice but to barter with the land. And so I read a lot of the slave narratives where, you know, that, that was the deal. They were going to work um, the land for X many years and then they would own a piece of land. And so Hanny and the other um, underage children who had no parents ever come for them, and this old auntie woman who's not really her aunt, but has to, who has raised all the stray children, you know, they are just on the verge of having earned out their contract and they'll own this little piece of land. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big time for Hanny, but, um, and she has huge stakes in getting a hold of that share crop contract because what happened to people a lot is when those contracts would come due, some excuse would be made to kick them off the land and replace them with another sharecropper who was starting all over on this process. So the, you did something with Hanny where she's wearing this necklace that has the three beads that are on, that are on it. Where did you come up with that idea? Because it was a lovely theme going through the book. And I'm not going to talk about some of the things that happened with that, but um, did you just get the idea like when you were reading ads from people or where did that come from? So that there's two places that came from. Um, one, the beads are often found when they do the archaeology at slavery sites. Uh, beads, beads are often found and the most common color found is blue. Hmm. Blue stood for protection. It's stood for community, it stood for good luck, and it was supposed to keep the haints and ghosts away from you because it's the, the color of heaven and they would, they would see it and be afraid. Um, so it kept the ghosts clear of you. 
so um, hence part of the reason Hanny's beads are blue. There is always, there's also a book called um, Help Me to Find My People. It's nonfiction about um, the lost friends and about families searching for family after the end of slavery and how they did it. And uh, in there is, is a story about a woman who gave her son uh, beads so that if they ever saw one another again, that they would be able to recognize each other because that was something I hadn't thought about until I read that true story. Um, mm -hmm. Years and years go by. Everybody's age. Yeah, they yeah don't want to everybody's see. age. Plus, it, yeah, exactly like people who have, you know, been separated by adoptions or whatever they look around on the streets all the time and think could be we could we be related because there's some point at which you would not recognize the person anymore perhaps yeah it, and it's true because but I just found that that symbol of okay so you know it was just something that was um, a part of her history that she was carrying with her and it was also something that was probably her most prized possession in a lot of ways because she knew it was a history you know with her past and going towards her future so now we have the 1987 story. And my question is, what made you choose 1987 as the year to start that story? And then tell us about Benny, who's there. So 1987, um, a, a couple of things. I was looking to back up closer to where we would have people still alive who had at least had direct contract, contact with the last survivors of slavery. So you, know, you sort of need to back up a little bit from, from today's date. Mm -hmm. um, in 1987, you know, I just remember 1987 well. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was in high school. Um, you know, so it seemed like it just in some ways seemed like sort of a nice time to go back to pre-internet, mm -hmm. um, pre-cell phones. Mm -hmm. You know, now it seems like ancient history, but in a way it seems... Um, peaceful and sweet too. Yes. The seventies are over. The seventies, you know, I remember the seventies too. They were very fractious and controversial, and the eighties just seemed to kind of settle in and be this this nice time um, in a lot of ways. And so, uh, nineteen eighty seven seemed about right for time frame. Uh, it was a time because it marked a certain point in my life, you know, junior and senior years of high school, that I can remember exactly what was going on. So it made it very easy to write about cultural references and, and things because I remember exactly uh, events and, and whatnot. And so it was kind of a fun, a fun jump back a little bit in the, the modern day being 87. Um, the teacher, Benny, is in a, she's trying to pay off her student loans and the way, and it was the way I knew various people who did it at the time I was getting out of college and whatnot. Um, they took these, these contracts with low-income schools to get their student loans forgiven. And I went through that journey with a few friends and uh, it, it was quite, you know, it was a hard, it was a hard journey. I mean, it was not what they thought, what they expected. Of course, tremendously rewarding for the ones who stuck it out and figured it out and, and were able to make the connection. But of course, first, first days, first weeks of anybody's teaching job, or are a shock. I come from a family of educators, so I, I've, I've watched that process. But you know, when you're going into a completely culturally different place, um, you're an outsider. A lot of places don't tend to be that welcoming to outsiders. And that's what Benny finds in Augustine, Louisiana. There's a certain system going on. Mm -hmm. And all the kids with money and influence, the school dividing lines are and the transfers are arranged in a certain way so that all the kids uh, with money and influence can go to one school and everybody else gets dumped in the other school. And we've lived in school districts like that where it, it's amazing the kind of gymnastics that are done to make sure these kids don't go to school with those kids. It makes and, it on the school board. You're on the school board to get your kid into the right school, you know? Exactly. Exactly. You know, well, or if you can afford to own two properties mm -hmm. and say, you know, fudge a little bit about which one you really live in or, I mean, there's all kinds of things that are done. Um, so, you know, Benny finds herself in, in the dump school, the school where everybody gets dumped, um, that, that nobody has any expectations for and that the kids are basically taught really not to expect anything for themselves. And because of where Benny comes from, she 
desperately wants to to help change that, but she doesn't really have any idea how to help change that. She's completely lost. She should be following the first year curriculum that they gave her and just said, just teach like this. This is day one. This is day two. Don't do anything different. But she becomes, I think that she goes in, she's a little naive when she walks in as well, but she has no idea what these children are actually going through at home. She doesn't understand that some of the kids are showing up hungry and she starts distributing food and she's not making a lot of money, but she's giving away a lot of food. And then she starts baking, which was really made me laugh because now we've got the teacher who goes home and is baking to get the kids to pay attention. It's just so well done because she's such a human person. Like you see her so clearly. So where did that come from? This whole idea of, gee, I should be baking as well. <laughs> Well, um, most things come from something in life. So that years ago, I grew up in the suburbs. So everybody I knew was kind of like me. You know, that's the thing about big cities with suburbs. You, you tend to be grouped with a lot of people who are kind of like you. You know, they live in houses about like yours. Their income levels about like yours. They're just sort of they're interested in the things you're interested. In. It's just all similar. Um, small towns are different. A small town is a homogenized microcosm of society. So you've got rich and poor, privileged, not privileged, uh, all, all living in very close quarters. It takes all the kids to make a baseball team. So kids of all different privilege levels are going to be on a baseball team or in a Sunday school class or whatever's going on in the town. So we moved to small towns when my kids were little. And at one point we had moved and I had one going into kindergarten and we got into this school and it cl became clear from, I have two boys, it became clear that the cool thing to do in this school was not take the cafeteria lunch because that meant you wouldn't get a seat at the table closest to the door, which was closest to the playground. So you would be slower to get to the playground and you would miss all the good things on the play. You wouldn't get a swing and all that. So it was a big deal. So I said, okay, and I'll start packing lunches. So I started packing lunches. It was just a few days before my younger one started coming home and saying, you know, mom, can I have two oatmeal cream pies or can I have two pudding cups? You know, and day after day, I would shoot him out the door and say, no, you know, one pudding cup per customer in this house, buddy, we don't do doubles. And so it's funny, you, you tend to tell your kids no before you ask them why. Mm -hmm. And eventually um, he kept asking and finally said, why do you keep asking me this question? I tell you every day, you cannot have two desserts. And he looked up at me with his big blue eyes and he said, well, my friend just every day in his lunch, he just has a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and nothing else. And I don't know why his mama packs his lunch that way, but we can split my chips because there's plenty and we can split an oatmeal cream pie if we have to, but pudding cups are really hard because we've only got one spoon and so one of us has to eat with our fingers. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and this is what's going on. And you're sitting there going, you can't have two. <laughs> I know, I know. And so, you know, he, he, he didn't understand why mama was packing um, lunch that way. But I, I, small towns, you know, everybody, my mom was a single mom. I'm working in a store in town. You know, I knew why mom's packing only a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for this kid. Um, she wants him to get to be at the, the cool table, but that's all she can do. And so obviously we sent extras for the rest of the year, but, um, but I then became aware of school bus drivers who were carrying snacks on buses, uh, teachers who were keeping snacks in file cabinets. It became very, you know, I became very aware that there were people in our community who were going hungry. There were kids who were not getting enough to eat. Um, we would have kids, um, leading two and three little brothers and sisters to, to Sunday school on Wednesdays because there was food there, mm -hmm. you know, and you'd find them tucking things in their pockets or asking, can I take one home to, you know, my other brother or sister who's too old to come or whatever. Um, you know, so I, it, that's where I got interested in feeding food banks, um, hungry kids. And so it's why that issue crops up with Benny because hungry minds can't learn, you know, and, and we don't understand um, the percentage of kids who live with food, food insecurity in this country. Now, wait, what are the 
cookies called that she's making? They're pooperos. What are they called? <laughs> Banana oatmeal raisin pooperos. Pooperos. I was laughing. Is the recipe somebody? You got to get the recipe up on your website or something. Like I'm going to have to get the recipe up on my website. Yeah. Um, definitely. That and a map of where everybody travels, which leads to my next question. I've heard you reference that this was a traveling narrative. And as a result, because they were going to multiple locations, you can't move cities and you can't move how long it takes to get places. So you actually have to map out in advance where they're going and what's going to end up happening. So did you have everything drawn yourself and then say two days, three days, five days, or how did you go about that? They didn't stay in one place at all. No, I, I did. And traveling narratives are, are so much harder to write because you have all these settings and modes of transportation to research. Right. And so I had, I had at one point slews of old maps. I ordered the easiest thing to me is to go back and find antique maps of, maps of the time. Because there are towns that the names have, are not the same now. Names of towns get changed. And towns just fade out of existence. And uh, so, you know, if you're going by a modern map, you can be wrong about what the town was called in 1875 or how far the railroad went in 1875. Mm -hmm. So I had slews of old maps pinned to the wall with showing railroad routes in those years and who ran them, um, showing towns, um, showing travelways and roads, showing where steam ship travel and how long the steamboat travel and how long that took. So um, just to figure out how, how would you get to Texas at that point in time? And so their journey ends up being this, this wild array of modes of 1875 transportation from um, riverboat to uh, steam train to on foot to wagons, just a little bit of everything because that's what you would have done. You would have gone up the Mississippi as far as you could go on a steamboat because compared to everything else, uh, riverboats were incredibly fast. That was incredibly dangerous. You may not live to get there um, because the average lifespan of a, a riverboat, these big boats made to go on the rivers was about four or five years. Wow. They blew up all the time or hit snags or because they're run on boilers and that was a tricky business and lots of people died in riverboat accidents so it was um, it was a dangerous mode of travel but it was much faster so you would have gone on a riverboat if you didn't have money you would have ridden right out there on the deck with the livestock and the packages and the everything um, that's how a lot of people travel so riverboat up the mississippi up the Red, turn on to the Red River, up the Red River, um, through the swamps to Jefferson, Texas, which was the most inland port in Texas at the time. And um, from there, you could have steam trained uh, to south of Dallas. The railroad had gone bankrupt at that point and didn't continue on to Fort Worth. So it was a few more years before Fort Worth became the big cattle shipping center um, that it that it became, you know, during the big Chisholm Trail days and all that, the Western lore that we see so much of. But at this time, Dallas is kind of a dusty little town and Fort Worth is a big nothing. Wow. You know, and, and it, just challenge yourself a little. Let's learn about the steamships, the, you know, steamboats, every single piece of transportation during that time. Let's not, you know, take the easy way out at all. <laughs> so when you're doing all this research, um, how do you organize your materials? Do you have everything online? I know you said the maps were up on the wall, but are you just making tons of notes and then writing? Or are you writing and getting yourself like, you know, blank, 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 fill in later with research? It's a little bit of both. Um, you, can, you can spend a lot of time for me because I don't plan my stories ahead. I discover them as I work. So if I do all the research ahead, I can spend a lot of time researching fascinating things that are absolutely do not end up fitting into the story. Right. right. Um, on the, the converse of that is that a lot of the story comes out of the research because you'll read something interesting, like as I was reading the slave narratives, you know, little pieces of life from those would come into the story or would inspire something in the story. So I, it's both. I try to get a rough draft down as quickly as I can 
because then I know a lot more about what I need to know. Okay. Um, and so it, it was kind of both. Um, I'm not, I wish, I wish, I wish I were one of these people who uses an organized piece of software to keep track of all my research, but, but I am not. I have documents full, full, full of internet links to different topics that I read. I, I had notes and documents and lists of things pinned up to the walls everywhere. Um, I, yeah, it, it was, it was pretty much of a zoo, but I knew where things were and uh, where I could go to get facts like how many miles does a horse travel in a day or, or you know, whatever I needed to know. So when you were writing this, because this is sort of on the heels of before we were yours, did, did you, were you on tour as you were writing or were you finally back settled in and just writing down? <laughs> So more normal for me in the past would have been back settled in for a period of writing time. But of course, with Before We Were Yours, uh, once, it, once it crawled its way onto the bestseller list uh, several weeks after publication, life got crazy. And we were also, we had a lot of other things going on. We had a, a, a man child graduating from college and, um, you know, we were scraping together old sets of silverware and uh, the furniture nobody wanted and all that to, you know, so that he could furnish an apartment. We were helping him make choices of job interviews. There was just a lot going on. We had moved to a different house. Um, never let your husband pick a house out for you while you're out of town. Um, so we were doing a lot of house remodeling, all kinds of stuff was going on. Anyway, uh, the, so I had this other manuscript that I would have just had to edit basically and and fill in some things but i had that first draft on the other manuscript done so when i decided to take on the book of lost friends i was scared um because it was starting from scratch and all these other things were going on but it just it traveled along with me it traveled along with me to hotels it's it's a not only a traveling narrative it was a traveling production um airplanes all over the place and uh, when I was home, I just, when I'm home and I'm writing, I try to be really strict about what amount I'm going to write per day. And, and what's, that at, usually? what's that, that usually? That's usually about like 2,200 words. Oh. Um, it's, it's seven pages, double spaced. So whatever that adds up to, but it'll get a book done pretty quickly. If I were home writing, that's a, that's a rough draft in three months or something like that. So um, and they always go longer than I thought they were going to, but you know, it, there's always more story to tell, we're but saying, you know, that's, a, that'll get a book done pretty quickly and efficiently. If you can maintain it, if you're home to do it, it's what works for me. Otherwise, uh, if I just had writing hours, I would just procrastinate for those three or four hours and then be done for the day. So, you know, I have to give myself a, a goal that I'm going to do. And it lets me know how fast the book will be done. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, a, not a sit around and wait for the muse or the inspiration kind of writer. It's great if people are, I know people who are, and they'll slam out a book in three weeks. Uh, I'm not like that. I write, if I feel like it, I write, if I don't feel like it, um, I, I, what works for me is get it on paper. If it may feel like junk that day and you may come back and it may be junk, you know, but you can take junk and fix it. Mm -hmm. I, I feel once the first draft is me telling the story to me and just figuring the story out and then I'll clean it up and get it ready for someone else to read. You know, one of the things that I was looking at too was with these ads, they were not inexpensive to do because the ads were, if you um, were a subscriber, I love this. If you were a subscriber to the Southwestern Christian Advocate, the ad was 50 cents. It was free. But if you didn't subscribe, it was 50 cents. And I did a translation this morning to what 50 cents would be in today's dollars, and it's $800. And I found it interesting that the ads were actually that much. I mean, it sounded like a lot when I was reading it in the book. Was it just because people, was this something people saved up to run one of these ads? It must have been. Um, it just shows what, you know, these people are having an incredibly difficult time. They, everything is stacked against them once they finally have their freedom. You know, economically speaking, everything is stacked against them. Um, so they, they're working really hard, a lot of them, just 
to make a subsistence living, to, to have food and clothes and the things they need. Sharecropping particularly was not an easy business, but it shows how important this was, that they were willing to devote money and resources to finding their families, to putting this information out there. And some of them placed multiple ads. You, some of them, when you look up that name on the database, Base, there's more than one ad that person placed over time just hoping to find their family. And I imagine most people subscribed to the Southwestern, uh, it, you know, that had, especially once you placed multiple ads, but it shows how much it meant for them. Were there any government solutions for ex slaves to help find their communities? Was there anything the government was doing at that time? I think. There were some things I read about through the Freedmen's Bureau, which was established um, in Reconstruction by the government, but not in any not in any vast official capacity. There were times when sometimes people would go, and I read this in some of the slave narratives and also in some of the research books. Um, so a lot of these people, they wanted to go and find their children, and some of these people, like I said, walked all the way across the country or all around the country to the places where they knew or last known or where they thought their children were being kept. And what happened when they got there could vary because a lot of people took these underage kids and just said, you're underage, um, you have to stay with us and work in the house or whatever. And um, so sometimes it was not the warmest reception or sometimes there was resistance. And that was something where people would go to the Freedmen's Bureau um, to establish their rights to a child, basically, and whatnot. But, uh, but there wasn't, this was something people, by and large, had to do on their own. And um, a lot of them, you know, that was what they devoted their energy to after they had the freedom to go. Yeah. Do you know how many were, what, what kind of success rate there was? Was, is there anything written about Oh, these people were found off of these ads or anything? Is there anything anecdotal even? There are a, a few ads. Um, in fact, there's one in the end of the book that is a reunion ad where someone's reporting back that they found family. But that I know of, no. Nobody's ever really done uh, the research on. And I don't even know if you could now because it's so long ago. All they know is who actually wrote back if they found people and reported it. Um, and they don't even know all of that because they're still finding every so often I'll hear from the keepers of the historic New Orleans collection and they'll say, well, we found some more lost friends in some other, you know, archive somewhere. And so they're still adding lost friends that they come up with. And one of the things they're doing now is um, getting the whole microfilm collection of the ads so that it would all be housed there at you know with the historic new orleans collection so that it would all be in one place um which i think is fantastic because this is such a piece of history you know it should be preserved not only for the the future generations who may trace their history back and want and find these but you know this is the true history um it's interesting because a lot of the books i read uh, I, I like to read the voices of the time period i don't really I mean, I, I do read nonfiction, but I, I really want to read the actual voices. I don't want it really filtered through a modern lens of a historian or whatever, telling me what it means. I really want to go back and read the voices of lived experience, the people who experienced it. And for slavery, of course, we have the WPA narratives. And then there are books that were written in the time period by people who um, either, either got free through the Underground Railroad or other means, Abolitionists would often sponsor the publication of books to show people what slavery was really like because this myth had been perpetrated about it being this benevolent relationship and, you know, benevolent slavery and all this, and um, which is ridiculous when you think about it, but that was the myth. And it's interesting because if you, if you look at the, um, the, the, one of the purposes, the Historic New Orleans Collection, puts forth for the Lost Friends database and, um, and their traveling exhibit that has to do with uh, called Purchased Lives, which is a panel exhibit that goes around to museums, is to dispel this myth even today 
of that this that these were some kind of benevolent you know that this was a benevolent system where people took care of people you mm -hmm. know and we even not that long ago that that was in politics somebody making that comment about how these were you know benevolent relationships or something you read through the lost friends ads and you do not see benevolent relationships mm -mm. no that's not what you're walking away with at all um but you're right if you go back and read the original sources it is completely different from seeing it from somebody else's eyes completely different thing you reference a carnegie library in louisiana that was very very different is that actually a library that existed and i'll leave so, it to readers to find out in the book what happens but i found it was so interesting right the, i love carnegie libraries for so many reasons they're beautiful for one thing and i've visited quite a few um so augustine's fictional the town so that their library is fictional but um here's where that library comes from at some time ago i visited one in texas and it just it just a little one in a little town it's a beautiful building because all the carnegie library buildings were beautiful mm -hmm. and of course they were sponsored on carnegie grants he's uh, built libraries all over the place the provisos of carnegie libraries really were that they had to be open to everybody so when i visited this one in texas to talk books with them and we all and it was a fairly tiny library so we just packed the the kind of book area of this beautiful little building and um and they said this is one of i think it was four it's been a few years ago now but they said this is one of four front carnegie libraries in texas most people wouldn't take the grant because they had to be open to everyone which meant irrespective of race mm -hmm. um so i knew i wanted to put a carnegie library in this town and i went reading up on carnegie libraries and one of the things i did find was that when Carnegie, um, that was the thing with Carnegie things, you know, you had to be open to everyone. However, the Jim Crow laws in the South made, a, made that a problem. And so um, one of the, Carnegie did sponsor some libraries that were originally Carnegie colored libraries, which is the case with the one um, in Augustine. Yeah, it's exactly, because, and I was reading that and I was like, I just hadn't thought about those at all. You know, I hadn't thought about it from that point of view. I think my library when I was growing up was a Carnegie library and they, they were all different. They all looked different, but I mm -hmm. guess they had the same values that were behind them. But it's not like the architecture was the same. It was just what the philosophy was behind the library. They, they had to, they had, yeah, they, you had to submit your plans and, you know, they had to be, um, I guess, worthy of the Carnegie name or worthy of the Carnegie grant or but everyone I've been in is just incredible. They're just beautiful. And, um, you know, and a, a testament to books and learning and the idea that that should belong to everybody. Mm -hmm. Should be everybody. Speaking of which, when you were in school, did you love history? Was that your favorite class? I did love history. I loved history. I loved English. Um, I loved science until we got to physics and then there was too much math involved. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I loved history. I, I can always remember being fascinated in history. And, you know, in the time period I grew up, a lot of the, what we were watching on TV or reading was historical. We were reading Westerns and all that. Not that that's accurate history, but it still gave you a, fact, a fascination for history. And so I've always, 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 um, I grew up horseback. I was a little, a little pony girl um you know and i mean i was laura ingalls wilder and tarzan and zorro and anything else you know we 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 went in the summers we were horseback from the time we could finish our cheerios and leave the house you know until the end of the day and all we did was play something historical you know we were knights and ladies and um anything we could anything you could do historical we went out and pretended it i love it I love it. So, you know, it's funny because uh, in the book, there, I'm not going to share exactly what happened there. Um, Benny has her students getting involved in something to learn about more about history and what's going on. And I always think that there should be more boots on the ground learning about history as opposed to just reading textbooks. And I think it's the reason I enjoy historical fiction because while it's still a book, it's not just a bunch of facts, but it's a bunch of feelings at the same time. And it's a bunch of personalities. And I just love what she's trying to do with these students that is far, far beyond what they understand is going on at that point. 
do you, what do you feel about doing like living history kinds of things to bring it to life for people? Oh, I, I think it is so valuable. I mean, I, I think until you can internalize history as the stories of people, because stories do things too, as they've even proven with the brain science that when you read a book, um, if you read about jumping into a pool of water and they put the diodes on your brain, it's lighting up the same way as if you were jumping into a pool of water. You know, which means that what we read is really becomes part of our, it's an experience. It becomes part of our experience. And so when we can take history in stories like that, when we can begin to understand it in story format um, through living history as the story of a person, then I think we take in history in a whole new way and the lessons that history teaches. Because when, when we don't learn the lessons or when we forget them, then we make the same mistakes. Totally agree. And I think that it, the more of that, that needs to be happening, you know, so much is teaching to the test. So much is just, this is the way you need to learn. And yet I feel like a lot of historical fiction taught me a lot more than I ever learned in school because I'm seeing the whole, the wraparound of everything that's going on instead of just this is this battle, this is what ended up happening, but you really feel like you're traveling down on the riverboat, you're traveling with these people, and you see how brutal the journey was, which you didn't really see when you were just studying history. You didn't understand it quite the same way. So it seems like the title of this book was a no-brainer, am I right? <laughs> it was a no-brainer. It was an absolute, the, a lot of books get retitled, but this one had its title from the very beginning. Um, <laughs> I just looked at it, I was like, wait, that's kind of perfect. It's just kind of perfect where it came from and where you know people remember to be talking about. It's just great. So this is your 32nd book, which is quite an achievement. Are you already working on your next project or are you just working on promoting this one at this point? Um, a little bit of both. I am starting to dig into the research for the next project. There's always something hanging out there that I really know I would like to write about. There are always really lots of several somethings, but usually there are one or two pressing somethings that I really want to write about. So um, I'm starting to dig into the research on a couple of them and see. Sometimes it's, you know a story sounds good, and until you dig into it, you don't really know if you can gel a story about it. But um, so that's that's my next my next project. Yeah. So just figure out, okay, where are we going to go next? What are we going right. to do? Yeah. Right. Um, are readers able to talk to you, uh, book groups? Do you do a lot of talking to book groups or, or is your schedule such that you can't even do that? I do it all the time. You do. So oh, people yeah. can just reach out on your website and tell you that they want to talk about this book or before you were yours or whatever book they're interested in speaking with you about. Yeah, I do it as much as I can. You know, obviously I don't get to do all of them and there's a lot of times when we just can't work it in, but um, when I can, I love to talk to book groups. You'll be Zooming all over the country. You'll just won't have to leave <laughs> the house. You'll just Zoom every place. Thank you so much for joining us today. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book. I learned so much from reading it. And it's just been such a pleasure to get to hear more about the background. You can see I had pages of notes. There are pages all over here of questions I was just burning to ask you after reading it. So thank you so much for joining us today. And lots and lots of luck to you with the book. Oh, this has been a tremendous pleasure. Thank you for having me. And we look forward to sharing this with our readers. And until next time, Book Reporter talks to. Thanks so much.